Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar at the tangibles around modern airline retailing. Uh, this is a webinar that's kind of a follow-up on what we did uh, last year. So we'll be discussing uh, with our panelists what's happened in the last 12 months, what does the future look like, uh, etc. Now, just before we dive into discussions uh, with our panelists, I just want to give you a little bit of background um, about what's happened since last year. And there are just five things I want to share with you. Um, first of all, I don't know if you saw the video I recorded that's available on iatoretailing.org, which is, uh, it was before about six, seven weeks ago. Um, and it recaps what happened, particularly since our symposium that took place in Chicago in October last year. And it really shows a great momentum on the journey to modern airline retailing. NDC, when friends left the station, it's definitely happening now. But what's really important here, and what's changed in the last 12 months is that it's just, it recognizes just one step towards the broader end vision of 100% offers and orders. Because that's the only way to true customer centricity and the only way for airlines to get to adopting those typical retailing capabilities. And this is also important because some of you may be, you know, thinking about some of the challenges there are with NDC still today. But some of those challenges are there simply because NDC is not designed in such to work with e-tickets, PINRs and EMDs. It's designed to work with orders, which is why, again, having this context of the end vision is so important. But that's where the, the whole industry is now shifting to the end vision and NDC is just one step. And by the way, one important thing as well that's starting to come up, particularly through some of the leading airlines, is that it's not just about technology. If you don't get the people and process part right, you ain't going to succeed. And that's something that people tend to forget quite often. Also, in the last 12 months, the consortium, which is 16 airlines, and we just had three uh, airlines join recently, uh, which are Air India, Cathay Pacific and Air Canada. Um, so this consortium has delivered quite a lot in the last 12 months. It delivered a business case, a reference architecture, some transition pathways from an IT perspective, and, and many more. And only two days ago, actually it's kind of all over LinkedIn as we speak, uh, it also released a 50-page document called Procurement Considerations for a Retailing Platform in Offers and Orders Only. And this is what airlines can use when talking to their technology partners um, to see what they want to consider um, when procuring a platform for retailing with offers and orders. And one last thing uh, just to add on this is that um, in IATA we've made a slight change. It's a little detail, but it reflects how we have to evolve as well. And there's some other areas where we need to evolve, but we've brought distribution payment together because that's what we see our member airlines are doing uh, under the commercial hats, bringing a lot of airlines are bringing commercial uh, distribution and payment together. Within IATA, that's what we've done to enable us to follow and anticipate transformation as much as possible. So that's the industry uh, overview. As I said, NDC is happening, but it's just one step towards an end goal. And some airlines tech providers have already started that journey uh, to the 100% offers and orders. But at the starting point, I think, on the one hand, it's important that the industry is pretty much aligned on this end vision. And what we recommend to airlines who start now it's not just to do NDC because it's NDC. We recommend that you should look at the full context of modern airline retailing, a world of 100% offers and orders, and then decide individually what is your pathway, because each airline will have a different pathway. And although it's an industry journey where all the stakeholders are working together towards this end vision, we know that value creation will depend on what the priorities each airlines will have, what market, the markets in which they operate, the size, their business model, et cetera hence different strategies. So that's what we're going to talk about um, with our guests today. And I would like to introduce, uh, and if they can come on screen, it would be fantastic. Um, we're going to have Keith Wallace, who's the Managing Director of Customer Digital and Distribution at Air Canada. Jeff Christensen, who's Director of Distribution. And if I may just add as an aside, I forgot that Keith Wallace is also the Chair of the IATA Distribution Advisory Council. So let's uh, let's kick off maybe uh, with you, Keith. Um, can you just give us a bit of a background? I want to start this session first talking about NDC because you've both started on NDC and you've both got offers and orders on the radar. But I want to start with NDC first. So Keith, can you um, first tell us what is Air Canada's NDC strategy? 
Sure, thanks Yannick, and and thanks for inviting me to be a part of this today. I I, I love doing these sessions. I think it's really important that uh, at the, in the airline industry we all have a chance to share information and learning experiences together. So, for Air Canada, we've been on an NDC journey for a number of years, uh, but really I would say the, the latest phase of our NDC journey kicked off the summer of last year, where we took the the bow and the wrapping off of a brand new set of web services. Um, uh, a whole new set of capabilities and functionality is really kind of a brand new NDC gateway that we put into the market in the summertime. And with that, we launched uh, a new kind of overall product and content strategy around that to try and support adoption. I would say that our proposition in the marketplace was a bit more deliberate and cautious than maybe some uh, other airlines have taken. And that is not a comment on, on what we have done versus what other airlines have done. Well, we'll come back to that anyway, Keith, because I know what you're referring to. So I'll certainly we'll mention that. People Wonderful. have that in mind, but please, yeah. So our strategy was uh, was very one uh, one of kind of slow and cautious adoption. So we did have uh, a few strategies in place. Uh, we did put a surcharge into the market, mostly just to recover the ever increasing and uh, and really unsustainable costs of distribution through Edifact. But then on the NDC side, uh, there was some content differentiation. Our, our, mo our, mo our lowest fare brands, the basic fares, are only available uh, in our NDC channel. We run uh, tactical promotional codes and discounts uh, regularly every week that are only available through NDC. We have some structural fares, especially with our AGB partners out of Europe. Uh, that are cheaper in the NDC and web channels than they are in Edifact. And we price our ancillary products, most notably paid seats, but all of our ancillary products are priced more aggressively in the NDC channel. And then, I, so that would be kind of what we launched into the market with. And that's been in place for about nine months now. And uh, since then, we've been aggressively working to honestly probably catch up with the rest of the industry on continuous pricing, and we'll be putting uh, continuous pricing into the market this summer. Great, I think that, that's a pretty good roundup. Keith, just before I go to Jeff to, to kind of give us the, the same, uh, the, the, their position parallel, just for everybody on the call to, on the webinar to note that uh, this is being recorded, so you can play it back afterwards if you want and share it with people. Uh, also, there's, there's a question box, uh, so if you want to send any questions uh, to Jeff and to Keith, please do so, I'll try and take them uh, in about 15 minutes or so. So Jeff, yeah, well, well, where's United in this journey? So I want to touch on kind of the two different aspects that we think about. The first is our systems approach. And so really our system strategy is to deliver a better experience for the customer and for travel agencies. I think about something we have in our industry that's called the debit memo. And it provide. I mean, there's a lot of complexity in what we do, and we think a lot of it's unnecessary. And so, as you think about a debit memo, really, as an airline, we are auditing what a travel agency does. No one likes to be audited. No one likes debit memos. I hate debit memos. Agencies hate debit memos. We think about ways to just take out friction in what we're doing, and and candidly, to remove something that doesn't really have benefit for me, it doesn't really have benefit for an agency, and it certainly doesn't serve any benefit to the customer. And so that's an example of where we're trying to make things streamlined, we're trying to stop doing things that don't add value. And so really from a systems perspective, it's about making the systems less complex and better. To touch on some of the items that Keith touched on, so from an overall distribution approach, we do not have a distribution cost recovery charge in place. We, we don't have that. Uh, we do have uh, content differentiation. For example, in September, we began to offer basic economy only via NDC for our US domestic markets and for short haul Latin routes. Uh, Keith touched on continuous pricing. We have continuous pricing in place. It's a project we started in 2019. Our proof of concept went live in 2020, and year after year, a little bit at a time, we've expanded. At this point, we offer continuous pricing on all O&Ds that we serve around the globe, and it's offered in all cabins, including our premium cabin. 
such as Polaris. Jeff, what's the um, what's in it for the customer? I understand continuous pricing is great for the revenue management geeks who want to squeeze an extra dollar out of each seat. But what does that mean for the customer? So I've heard of airlines that have designed continuous pricing so you can take the price up or you can take the price down. And I've heard someone stand up in a conference once and say, oh, continuous pricing, you win some, you lose some. That's not what we've designed. We have an approach where Edifact and NDC can be the same because of continuous pricing or NDC can be cheaper than Edifact. It is you win some or you tie some. That's the way we've structured it. We believe if you actually raise the price using continuous pricing, people would switch to the old technology. They'd go back to the ATP co-filed fare, they use the legacy technology. It serves no purpose to increase the price using continuous pricing. And so our approach is it's a discount or it is the same. Right. Um, <clears throat> to you, Keith, and actually both of you, I know some airlines are happy to share this, some just prefer not to. Can you share what your NDC penetration is and where where you, would you have any objectives in the next couple of years? Just starting with you, Keith, on that. Sure, absolutely. You know, I, I, I think you're right, Yannick. Um, airlines are often a little reticent to share kind of concrete data. Um, uh, Air Canada has been in the past. I think it's high time that we all kind of uh, start sharing a bit more uh, specifically where our successes are and where we have challenges because I think we're all uh, uh, facing the same kind of opportunities and hurdles um, and uh, it's only through sharing that we're gonna you know be able to help each other so um, I would say that probably most airlines some are super successful most airlines would tell you that they're not yet where they want to be and Air Canada would probably be the same but um, you know our latest metrics uh, through some efforts end of last year, early this year, we're really starting to see some encouraging signs of adoption, which I'm really excited about. Um, you know, the, the most kind of high level metric would be what percentage of the indirect agency coupons are going through the NDC channel. And if I look at that number at Air Canada kind of globally, all points of sale, we're just now starting the kind of the March timeframe to start to see 12 to 13 percent of our of our agency coupons coming through the NDC channel. If how much I can, is that last year, Keith? Sorry. How much, that, how much has that changed in the last 12 months? Just to get a sense. Oh, of... oh super significantly. I mean, to, to be fair, we did do that reset last summer, um, but at that time the penetration was barely five percent. I would say four or five percent globally. Okay. Um, and then you know, if I can be permitted to use them not to be accused of uh, padding my own stats but we launched the NDC channel for Air Canada in the Canadian point of sale first and it was the only place that we had it available up until the end of last year when we started opening up some new markets like the US, uh, the UK, Australia and now we have France but if we look at just if I go away from the geographic metric and I look at point of sale Canada it's actually even more encouraging because we've had more time to, to secure adoption but um, just uh, last uh, this month in March, we hit 18% in Canada of uh, of our of our indirect sales coming over the NDC channel, and kind of this time last year, that again was about four, five, six percent. Okay. All right, so that's quite a hefty increase in two, three years. Two, three years, sky's the limit. Um, I won't be so bold to say that we'll be sunsetting at a fact, uh, but we have you know, five to 10 to 15% growth metrics each year, depending on what point of sale you're looking at. I would say we're, we're looking to be at 20% at the end of this year, 25% at the end of 25. And then our long range plans look to us in the next three to four years, getting to at least half of our coupons coming over in DC. Great, thanks Keith. So Jeff, I think same question to you and I just add on top of that. Um, I mean, to what extent do you think uh, the GDS readiness, in particular Sabre in, in North America, for example, and even you know Amadeus and Travelport being ready as aggregators, because we're seeing that all over the place. So how much would that accelerate? So can you share where you are today and uh, where you see in the next two, three years in the world of GDS is becoming aggregators now? I'm using a similar metric as what Keith shared, but I don't think I use coupons. I think I'm looking at tickets. So looking at volume though, as indirect channel, 
Yeah. Last year, I, I, we were about 1%. I think we rounded up to 1% to make ourselves feel good. Uh, today, we're, we're above 30%. And so well, we've seen a dramatic move in our volume of NDC. And so, yeah, it's, it's great. As so we what, what, looked, the, what, what, what was the cause of that, Jeff? Uh, primarily, our moves with basic economy have, right. have uh, stemmed some players that, that had been talking to us about making changes to, uh, we'd been in discussions for some time, they decided to move towards the NDC channel as we made that particular change. Right, and in two, three years? So we don't have a metric that we're or we, we we're measuring our stats, but we don't have a number that we're shooting for. We we're really focused on making uh, NDC better than out of fact. We want the customer to be happier. We want just there to be a natural pull towards NDC because it offers such a better experience. We don't have a target at this point. You you asked about GDSs. Yep. Yep. We've been working with all of the GDSs for some time to get NDC in a place where, where customers are using it. And we are just starting to see the fruits of those efforts. And so there hasn't been uh, tons of movement, but we're seeing bigger and bigger players come to us and say, you know, we're using GDS so-and-so, we think we're ready to start uh, connecting to NDC with the GDS. And so I think in the coming months, just like we had a hockey stick with some of the leisure players, we're gonna start to see more of the business type of players come onto the scene. Great, and um, actually that's quite an, an important point here, the business players. Um, well, well, let me, um, yeah, let me play that one to Keith then real quick. What, what, what do you see, Keith, how's business travel going? Because that's where, we see that there's most challenge, whether it's the TMC or the OBT level. Uh, we hear that it's around servicing, amongst others. Well, what is your view at Air Canada then that, around the business travel segment? It is absolutely, it has absolutely been the most challenging segment of travel for us to gain traction with NDC. Um, it definitely was and still is to some part uh, a matter of technology. So, uh, I would say that the Air, I would say confidently that the Air Canada NDC channel supports uh, all of the shopping pricing, order creation plus order servicing uh, that corporations need. Our ability to encourage the ecosystem to adopt and use all those services has been slow. I would say that um, most of the corporate booking tools now uh, have the prime booking flow done. Uh, order changes that some of the more nimble or looking booking tools uh, agree they have to do, but it has uh, by and large been kind of a slow journey in terms of their adoption of that technology. But even with the corporate booking tools, you know, we, we will get there eventually with them. Uh, there are lots of processes inside TMCs that corporations rely on that are kind of outside the scope in some way of pure NDC technology but are really important for corporations and we hear that from them today so making sure that when uh, people book over NDC we can supply data back into that ecosystem to the TMC or to the corporation directly so that they can track on spend report on spend they can track their travelers and provide them the duty of care all of those are really important and they're extra connections extra technology that uh, airlines need to invest in to make sure that we're uh, giving everything that the corporations need for their travel program. But I would say, you know, we will also get there with that. But the encouraging thing is that I would say, at least in my experience over the last three or four months, there has been a, a much greater understanding amongst corporate travel program managers about what NDC can offer. And we're starting to have really interesting conversations with corporate travel managers about what do you want the experience in your corporate travel program to be when you're booking and traveling on Air Canada? And let us use NDC technology to create unique products for you to drive that experience. That's really exciting. Okay. Jeff, a kind of similar question, but a slightly different spin to it. Um, um, one of your competitors in the US market has been uh, quite aggressive right now, uh, particularly with the, uh, well, I think in its whole uh, 
uh, strategy in this uh, in this area of retailing. Um, so how does the United strategy compare to that? Because a lot of people are trying to make a parallel. Can you just clarify what, what where you stand compared to what uh, this main competitor is doing? Yeah, you, you're talking about uh, what major player in the U.S. And so we look at their strategy and, and we see the wisdom and what they're focused on. We see value in NDC, just like they see value in NDC. Um, as we look at how to get people to move from old to new, our whole focus is it's got to be better. It's got to be an enhancement. There's got to be a compelling case to just move because the technology serves the customer in a more complete, a more thoughtful, and in a more intuitive manner. Kind of building on what Keith shared and thinking specifically about the corporate type of customer, I think about the additional needs that a corporate customer has. And I'm, I'm going to kind of go a little bit in the other direction. I'm actually concerned about right now we have an opportunity to modernize all of these extra things that a corporate customer needs uh, and i'm a little concerned that we're focused on converting everything that ndc does back, back to legacy type of setups or back to legacy type of systems and just to kind of share an analogy when I was 16, I had an old Mazda. I had a 1986 Mazda 323. I love music and I love listening to music when I drove, still do. And uh, I looked at this car and realized it had a tape deck. You know, I'm talking about with a cassette tape. And yeah, actually, so... my, my daughters wouldn't know what you're talking about, but I do, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and so, that was the way I had to listen to music. And I had CDs, right? I had compact discs. And so whoever invented the CD created this incredible outcome. It's a digital uh, reproduction of music. You can listen to music digitally. And I had a buddy say, you know what you need to do? Get your disc man, get a tape converter, and you put this little thing that looks like a tape mm. in the cassette, in the tape deck, it has a wire that connects to the Discman, and you can listen to your CDs in your very old car on your very old speakers. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm worried that we're taking something that's modern and digital, and we're taking it and we're converting it and leaving it kind of in an analog world. And I would love to see more and more players look at opportunities to modernizing their stack as well. I, I'm a little worried that that conversion from digital to analog, as I'll call it, okay. is what takes time. It's what's kind of slowing us down. All right, no, no, thanks for that, uh, thanks for that, Jeff. Just a couple of uh, questions uh, being put on the screen in front of me that the audience have asked. So I'll ask you some quick responses because after that I want to go to um, offers and orders in the consortium. Um, but someone's asking, I think it's you, Keith, who said, uh, you said that OBTs uh, were outside of scope. Is that what you said, Keith? OBTs are out. no, they're they're not out of scope. Uh, I'm very much like them to be in scope. Uh, it is it is it has been it has been challenging to encourage them to adopt and use and take advantage of all of the services and all of the functionality that Arcana has to offer. We hear from corporate clients that you know it's not enough just to make my purchase in my booking tool. I don't want to have to then pick up the phone and call my TMC when I want to change to the flight at 10 instead of the flight at 9. Yeah. Some servicing is super complicated and requires human intervention. I get it. I would say the majority of servicing can be done quickly and easily with a couple of clicks and a booking tool. And we think it's quite frankly preposterous that we're not providing servicing in these corporate booking tools, especially when the service is provided by the airline and permit uh, support it. So if I make a booking through a, a large booking tool in the US, for example, on an Air Canada flight to change it, what do I need to do? Call my TMC, call the airline, or if it's, well, I guess there's no NDC pipe today, there is there. So I, you, we have a couple of options. We've taken the steps, and I won't speak for Jeff, but I think United has had the same vision, um, and a few airlines have, is that we're not gonna, we're gonna do everything we can to make sure our customers are not left high and dry. If they can't make that servicing call in their booking tool of choice, 
we'll let them come to aircanada.com and do it. So we've made kind of omni-channel investments that if you made your booking through an NDC channel, somewhere out in the world, a booking tool or otherwise, and you want to buy a seat or change to the flight an hour later, and you can't do it where you made the booking, come to aircanada.com and we'll help you. Okay, just question for you, Jeff. When um, when you say, when you talk about NDC with the GDS, the GDS being an aggregator, someone's asking, who owns the offer? We own the offer, yeah. United creates the offer. That, that's the beauty of NDC, and that's the beauty of what Keith is describing. And similar to Keith, I think we have kind of the same setup, and this isn't universally true. There are airlines that take a different approach. The ticket, the offer is created by United. It's created by the airline. The ticket is issued on my ticketing services. There right. is not ticket control. Basically, I create a ticket, I give you rights to service it as a travel agency. And in fact, the customer can go wherever they need for servicing. It's my ticket, they can go to my website and get servicing, and that's not gonna break the ticket control. There's no such thing. Uh, the customer can go to my website and then call the agency and then come to my mobile app. Wherever they wanna get servicing, they can get servicing. And to Key's point, if there's a gap, if there's an issue, the agency doesn't have to call me to get things solved, right? The customer can use whatever channel they want to get things done. They can call me, we'll, we'll, we'll welcome that type of support we can provide, but they don't have to call me. We've, okay. we've enabled something that's quite different and is better for the customer. The, um, I, I wanna move on to uh, offers and orders now. I'm gonna start back with you, Chief. Um, the 100% the offers and orders. Um, it's another upheaval, yeah, it's another big step in this journey, which I know Air Canada uh, has definitely got it in its radar, but can you share with us, I, guess, I know your CEO, to what extent is your CEO involved? And assuming you had to sell this to your CEO, how did you sell this end vision to your CEO for him to kind of get it and uh, acknowledge it? Yeah, our CEO is definitely involved in our offers and orders strat, well, involved, aware and supportive of and driving us to move as fast as possible. It can be a curse or a blessing, but I would tell you it is amazing to have top-down support right from the C-suite. We actually made presentations to our CEO and executive committee, and then after that, presentations to our board about the benefits of offers and orders. And every airline constructs their story differently. There are, are a multitude of benefits, whether they're customer experience, revenue, or cost savings. Our position to our board was, Air Canada has been a, a bit of a leader, at least has a lot of experience in creating fair brands, providing options to customers, and ancillary sales. There, We have only scratched the surface of what is possible. With modern technology, modern airline retailing technology, we can really exponentially grow how we retail to the customer, what we sell, how we personalize. But we can already see today, as we make more complicated or at least intricate offers to our customers, our ability to fulfill and deliver those, we're really stretching current infrastructure. This, this idea of a, a PNR that holds your travel information, a ticket that holds your right to fly, and a series of EMDs that holds all of the extra items that you purchased, when you when it comes time to travel, deliver, change, disruption handling, that system gets really taxed. So our position to our C-suite and to our board was mm -hmm. that there is a pot of money available, incremental revenue that is very significant from really growing our retailing strategy. You will not be able to get even half of that if we don't modernize how we fulfill and deliver on those because the system will break down so badly that your customer experience will deteriorate and you will probably lose most of the incremental revenue that you could have made just from having disaffected customers. Okay, interesting. interesting. I see you nodding there, Jeff, just as you, uh, to help you complement your answer to a similar question. So, you know, how do you build a business case at United? Um, someone asked a question here, or made an observation saying, Jeff's talking tickets. When does Jeff foresee the end of tickets? 
Great question. Uh, there are relics that Keith's talking about that make servicing hard. We we talk internally about the hidden costs of Edifact. We think that we spend a lot of money making systems work together that weren't designed really to work together in a seamless manner. And so from our perspective, we set out a number of years ago to modernize our PSS or our passenger service system. And we were on shares, no one knows what that is probably, but we have our own proprietary PSS and we recognize the need to improve it. Uh, we have a business strategy that we need to be able to enable and we need our PSS to be more reliable than it is today. And so our approach has been probably different than most. We've started down a modularity approach or in other words, we are creating off-host modules for each core component of our systems. It's similar to rebuilding a car. We're taking out the transmission and we are putting in a modern brand new transmission. And there are some components of the new car that, that won't be used like tickets or PNRs and we'll replace them with an engine that, that works uh, quite different than, than the system we have today. At this point, we've developed modules for seats We've developed a module for availability. We've taken both of those off host. They don't, our, our share system doesn't rely or isn't even the system of record uh, for these particular services today. And so we're gonna keep going module by module until we enhance every component. And then one day we'll be able to get out of tickets. We'll be able to get out of PNRs. We will stop. Any idea on timelines for that tip? What's any that? Idea on, any, any idea on timelines when United may be processing the first orders? I, I on think I'm one of the people that think this is a longer journey. We, we think this is a marathon. I, I've heard people say that we're two years or three years out. We think we're much more than two or three years out. Okay. This is a big undertaking. But let me, let me ask Keith the same question. Um, when do you see the first orders in Air Canada, Keith, which is a slightly different question? The first orders. Jeff's point, Jeff's point is 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 incredibly important. I think it's something many airlines underestimate. I don't have a date for you because we are um, we feel we are at very 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 beginnings of a very long journey. Um, I think the idea of you know there's a very well established standard for what an order is and you just need to sunset pnr's tickets and emds and replace it with an order seems like a uh, an involved uh but a very kind of well scoped technology project it is way more than that right there are implications in the airport on board in your revenue accounting system in your tax system in your uh, law system in your contact centers um a lot of the work, and I think we're going to talk about it in a few minutes, that the consortium put out really opened our eyes. I don't know when we'll have our first order because we are very much at the beginning of that journey. Uh, we're committed to getting there, but it is a big scope for an airline to undertake. This is PSS migration level transition that we're trying to do here. Absolutely. There's one question from the audience, which is about um, what are your views on how Interline will work in a world of 100% offers and orders? Well, Keith, you go for that. I can't wait for offers and orders. It is going to make working with our partners so much easier. Um, Jeff and I share a unique experience being in the same alliance and in the same joint venture. Um, and it is shocking and appalling and disappointing and embarrassing uh, to say that United and Air Canada still struggle to figure out how we're going to sell customers seats on each other's aircraft. Trying to make very old systems uh, uh, that were never designed to do this work together has proven most of this gray hair comes from that. Um, honestly, we we speak inside Star Alliance about you know future looking technology, but we have tried for probably five or six years to make current technology work, and we're at a point now where we're just going to say stop, stop the insanity. Um, we are all investing in orders. Orders is going to make interoperability between airlines so much easier. I am 
desperate for the implementation of this because it will make working with Jeff so much easier. Yeah, I think it, actually this I'll, morning, oh, go on Jeff. I, I think that was a slide about working with me, Keith, but all good. <laughs> no, we, we, we think simply about, you know, one of the big things is there's a lot of places where you go, whether it's an OBT or an airline website, there are places where you have non-transactable seat maps. And that's such a core part of the journey. That's such a core part of what the customer experience is. When someone goes to my website and buys a code share flight on Air Canada, I have to tell them go to Air Canada to get a seat. Mm -hmm. Such a simple thing that our technology today doesn't support well. And to Keith's point, we want transactable seat maps everywhere. It, th this should just be a no-brainer, something that you provide to every customer, regardless of what itinerary they select. So to close, I'm just going to I'm going to come to you in a sec again, Jeff, uh, on the consortium. But just before that, I want to go to uh, to Keith about. Uh, Keith, so I know it's one thing that you've talked about a lot, which is payment. But what do you see as the benefits? Again, in a one-minute answer, please. What are the benefits of having payment and distribution working closely together? Uh, look, I, I think um, the fact that payments and distribution is finally coming together in the industry is so important because we talk a lot about distribution, how we get our product more intelligent, intelligently in front of customers, how we make experiencing our airline product easier, and how we get the customer from shopping to pricing to eventually booking but i think we all forget that we work so hard to make that experience simple that we get to the customer to a point where they decided what they want to buy they've got their wallet out and we mm -hmm. actually make that last step which honestly should be the simplest the hardest and we've worked the customer through all of our you know industry processes and now they're standing there with whatever payment option they want to use and us taking their money from them is exceptionally difficult and we introduce artificially i think so much friction in that process that the focus on making payment seamless easy interoperable across channels is something that is is has finally reached its time great no no thanks keith um makes complete sense um uh jeff when we were talking you were saying that um United are not on the consortium as such. However, you said that you'd been looking into some of the outputs of the consortium. Uh, in kind of one minute, is there anything that anything you can share where you saw value, the business case, the reference architecture, or whatever? Yeah, overall, I think the consortium is providing great value to the industry. I think one of the learnings we had with NDC is you need stakeholders that are ready to move forward to come together and, and understand what needs to be designed and how the design will work across all players in a seamless fashion. And so I'm excited that the consortium is growing. I hope that more uh, parts of the travel vertical are involved and some of the outputs that you've had, I think are fantastic. I think about the business case work that you put together, there was a section called the cost of doing nothing. I think that was really compelling, right? I, I think, you, you think, and Keith made this point earlier, the technology is end of life, right? We're, we're reaching the very limits of what the technology we've been using for decades can actually do. And if we don't move forward, if we don't advance the technology, it's the customer who gets impacted. And that's a yeah. bad outcome for yeah. everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff. And Kiki, kind of last words in one minute on your side. So A Canada's just joined the consortium. Uh, to be an active member. So as Jeff says, I mean, the, the outcomes of the consortium are available to all the industry. Um, but Keith, why, why in, again, in one minute, did you choose to join the, or yeah, did you choose to join the consortium? Yeah, it, you know what, if, if we hadn't been in the middle of our massive NDC rewrite uh, program a year and a half ago, two years ago, when the consortium was first launched, I think we would have would have joined in that case. But, you know, IATA had very uh, rigid participation uh, requirements for the consortium, which is completely valid. It only works if people are vested and contributing. And we just didn't think honestly we could meet that. But when the opportunity opened recently for you guys to expand the consortium, we were interested to get in. We've been customers uh, like Jeff of the outputs of the consortium for the better part of a year now, and they have greatly advanced our thinking. And honestly, some of the things that the consortium is now gonna turn its focus to are things that we're very interested in. 
and we honestly want a chance to influence the outcomes and it, it is a commitment mm -hmm. uh, of resources and time but we think it's important at least for us to have some influence on what the consortium does next right keith jeff uh, thank you very very much we're bang on time we had a nice conversation uh, i'm really sorry for rosario could join us he would have given another perspective but you know, still, we had a really good perspective from both of you. So thank you very much. Thank you for um, all the uh, people who attended this webinar. I hope you enjoyed it and have a nice evening, rest of day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Great to be with you. Thank you.